thank you very much, Ilya, for this very important context. And the reason why we needed this history is just to explain that you need to read beyond the headlines, and it's much more nuanced than it might appear at first glance, because obviously there have been serious efforts over five years of discussions to modernize the treaty, to talk about ways to bring it closer to the goals of the Paris Agreement, but definitely these are things that cannot be done overnight. However, as we just heard, after this revision process, after the text was proposed to the member states, they have decided not to vote, they have postponed it. So apparently they are not satisfied with the outcome of the reform process for now and we will yet see how it ends up. But still, it's very important to linger for a moment and to see what was put on the table, what, was, what were the comments and the reactions of the member states, and then, if possible, to comment on what are these reactions and what do you think they're based on. So, Krina, it would be wonderful to hear from you and your uh, perspective. How do you see the whole reform process and its aftermath? Thank you very much, Fahira, and uh, thank you, Ilya, for, for setting the scene. I just wanted to add to the interesting statistics at the end. The last slide is the outcome of this uh, uh, arbitrations under the Energy Charter Treaty, um, because it's one thing to be taken to the court, uh, and the other thing is the outcome of that arbitration. And the statistics show that um, in most of the cases, the respondent contracting party to the Energy Charter Treaty will prevail. Um, in 28% uh, of these cases, uh, tribunals found that there was no breach of the Energy Charter Treaty. 13% there was no jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal. And in 4%, although there was a breach, there was no damage. So we have uh, split 45 to 45% between investors and contracting parties. And I think this outcome shows that uh, to a great extent arbitral tribunals manage to understand, interpret, uh, and apply the Energy Charter Treaty uh, in the context of the specific circumstances of each case. But going back to m the modernization process, as it was said when uh, officially uh, has started in 2017, there was, uh, uh, in Astana, there was a, a, an approval of uh, the issues to be dealt with by the Energy Charter Modernization Group. So uh, already beforehand, those provisions in the Energy Charter Treaty have been identified and the work uh, was focused on those provisions and new provisions to be included in the new Energy Charter Treaty. As some of you uh, may know, and as Ilya mentioned, the Energy Charter Treaty is not only about investments and arbitration. There are other very useful provisions, uh, including the, the provisions on the environmental issues, uh, which was in, uh, in, uh, in a mi minority of cases referred to by arbitral tribunals. Um, we had the transit uh, provisions uh, proved to be effective in the numerous uh, transit, gas transit disputes between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, we also had the trade provisions in the, what we have in the Energy Charter Treaty, which help the non-WTO countries contracting parties to the Energy Charter Treaty to accede to the WTO, to, to, to face this accession process uh, easily. Um, so I think we have to keep in mind that uh, there are many still useful elements in the Energy Charter Treaty. Now, how the modernization process um, was dealt with behind closed doors, as we are today, uh, there was no transparency except for the few statements or general statements made by the uh, modernization group, um, um, effectively led by uh, Lukas Stifter, who uh, was the representative of uh, Austria in the Energy Charter Treaty and the head of the modernization group. But again, no transparency of the process, and that, from what I understand, uh, was meant to be a form of effectively and efficiently achieving uh, an outcome in a short period of time. If you open the doors and you let us in, ask the public, you'll probably not uh, have an outcome in, in such a short period of time. So the agreement in principle on, uh, on the Energy Charter Treaty was in June this year. Uh, from my knowledge, there were two free uh, draft 
uh, papers, draft mo modernized energy charter treaty leaked to the public. So we do have some information at least on uh, the preliminary text that was put forward to the contracting parties. When it comes to the outcome, uh, before I, I, I go a bit in the, in the proposed uh, um, uh, changes to the treaty, uh, when it comes to the outcome, the Energy Charter Treaty is very peculiar. Some of you know that we have the treaty, we have the Secretariat of the Energy Charter Treaty, uh, we have the depository contracting party, which is Portugal, uh, but on top of that, the Energy Charter Treaty is part of a series of elements uh, which were set up in 1991 and continue in 1994 with the, with the signing of the Energy Charter Treaty in 1998 in force, and then we had the modernization of the Energy Charter, uh, European Energy Charter, which was the basis, the commencement of the Energy Charter Treaty, and that modernization process of the European Charter uh, uh, converted it in, into an international energy charter um, uh, in recent years. Um, and all these elements taken together, they are supervised by the Charter Conference, which includes obviously the contracting parties to the Energy Charter Treaty, and of course there are observer states which are signatories to the International Energy Charter. So a very, I would say, complex um, um, framework in which the Energy Charter Treaty activates. So in order to get to the approval of by the contracting parties of the amended Energy Charter Treaty, that has to be put into discussion in the Energy Charter Conference. And this is what we had yesterday, the Energy Charter Conference meeting, where the amended uh, text of the Energy Charter Treaty was supposed to be approved by all the members of the, Energy Confer of the Charter Conference, all of them, so unanimity. And then once approved, it could go to each contracting parties individually, and each contracting party would decide whether to approve it or reject it. The Energy Charter Treaty modernized form would have entered into force if approved by three uh, quarters of the contracting parties. So there are two stages of the process. And this is why the European Union, uh, given the internal vote uh, on Friday last week, uh, decided to remove uh, the, the modernized treaty from the agenda of the, energy, uh, of the Charter Conference because there was no way uh, it could get the unanimous vote uh, to proceed with the second stage. So this is why perhaps in April next year we'll have this. Now, moving to the provisions, there are obviously many amendments, but I would put them in uh, three categories. The first category deals with, as Ilya was mentioning, the transition to clean energy, complying with the commitments uh, under the international instruments, including the Paris Agreement. Um, and the reality, as you could see, is that the Energy Charter Treaty equally protects renewable clean energy and fossil fuel energy. The idea was to remove the protections of the fossil fuel en energy in order to have this transition to the clean energy. If contracting parties are hit every day with claims from investors in the fossil fuel industry, uh, it will be impossible to focus on the end goal, which is to meet the, the targets of the Paris Agreement. Uh, how was that proposed to be done? Two streams. The first one, and I think the third panel today will cover this, uh, including sustainable development provisions in the Energy Charter Treaty, uh, which was the old provision on environment, uh, now uh, well expanded and with uh, uh, ample reference to the international commitments of each contracting party, and the provision on climate change, which is very important for the Energy Charter Treaty. There, there, was a, there is a proposal to have a specific provision on climate change and energy. The second stream concerning this uh, transition to the clean energy was to amend the definition of economic activity in the energy sector, which is the core, uh, let's say, uh, notion of the Energy Charter Treaty. And that was done by way, very interesting, by way of annex to the treaty, 
meaning that for the existing investments in the fossil fuel uh, industry, there, was a, there, there is a gradual phase out of 10 years, as, as Ilya mentioned, with some exception until 2040 uh, extended protection for certain types of, uh, of uh, energy materials and products, for example, pipelines uh, that can be used for the, for the tra transportation of uh, clean energy and so on. And uh, for investment made after 15 of August 2023, no protection uh, in, in this context. So obviously a better deal than the 20 year sunset clause uh, that was mentioned earlier. So two ways of achieving this goal, uh, in my opinion, probably effective uh, if, if one can think about it. The second category of provisions uh, reflect the experience of the contracting parties in this 150 cases. And I'm not sure if that's the right approach when you draft an international treaty. A treaty has to be uh, approached to uh, last over time and to be adaptable to the new realities. Uh, the proposals was effectively to uh, address the concerns in these cases. For example, the definition of investment uh, in the modernized treaty, uh, it was introduced the so-called Salini test uh, with all the additional criteria for the investment, definition of investor with the requirement of investor having a, su a substantial business activity in the country of incorporation, so uh, effectively addressing the, the concerns of, uh, of um, uh, shell companies, uh, those incorporated in fiscal paradises and, and treaty shopping. Um, and of course, on the standards of protections, fair and equitable treatment, most of the Spanish renewable cases uh, where tribunals took different approaches on the fair and equitable treatment, the legitimate expectations of, of investors, um, concerns with uh, uh, the third party funding, with frivolous claims, uh, with evaluation of damages and so on. It's, it's, there are, I would say, complex proposals of modification of these provisions. And last category, and, and uh, I'm sure we can discuss more about each individually, the last category of modification or amendments is effectively allowing in the context also of the transition to the clean energy, allowing the contracting parties to deal with um, uh, changes in their regulatory framework without being punished for doing so, uh, including the uh, uh, implementing um, uh, measures uh, effectively, for example, encouraging renewable energy or, or dealing with the phase out of fossil fuel. And that is the sovereign right to regulate of a state, uh, which in the modernized treaty is recognized in a specific provision. Um, also uh, uh, establishing an additional category of exceptions from the treaty, for example, in case of war, uh, which is relevant in, in our context nowadays. And the last one uh, concerning expropriation. So th there is a lot to put there, and I would say on, on, a, on overall, the suggested amendments could have been useful for the contracting parties.